Okay, we've started live streaming. Yay. So welcome everybody to today's April 5th Extraordinary Infrastructure Meeting. I'm going to start with the apologies for this meeting. We have Councillor Sopa, Councillor Crackett, and Jeff Grant. Moved. And I have no, I've had no word from Councillor Kett. So moved. Councillor Ludlow, second, Ms. Coote. Put that, all those in favour? Aye. 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 Uh, zooming, we have Councillor Clark, Councillor Abbott, we have Michael Day, Rhiannon Suda, and Hayden Powell. Uh, on that, Mr. Chairman, I'm afraid I'm like the Emperor with no clothes. I can't have a camera. Well, I think you didn't have a camera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're in the all together, okay? Yeah. I'm not quite, but I just don't have any film uh, on the camera. Right, yeah. No, that's so okay. Not... As long as your audio is good. And if you just just interrupt if you do want to say something, if you can. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, right, let's move on to the deliberations of the Roading and Traffic Bylaw um, speed review. Now, uh, Russell and David, would you like to come up to the table? Um, what I'd like to do is if you can um, talk us through the process that's happened. We've got the resolutions in front of us, the recommendations. Um, and I think if, if after you've given us a brief, I'd like to, for you to dwell down on each of the main recommendations, which are five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, just to just to cover them off so uh, that provides clarity um, to all of those. And then we can ask some questions and move through them. Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to present this report, which is our roading and traffic bylaw um, following the speed review con consultation. Um, we have Rhiannon and um, Hayden on the Zoom call. Um, they form from, they are from our strategic and strategy and policy team, and David McCormick to my right, who's our road asset engineer, who is. Um, my technical advisor um, on speed, so he's he's the man who knows most about speed, um, and they will be able to help us with some questions as we go through. I thought it may be helpful to run briefly run through, I guess, our process a little bit, and what we've seen and what we understand. So perhaps just put a little bit of flavour on there. So I just have got some comments on the recommendations, just how we've structured them and what they mean. Um, I think it's worthwhile just having a little bit of an um, overview on what the consultation process from our viewpoint. And David will run through a couple of examples that hopefully will give you some insight about how we see this could actually run it, run across. And they'll look at some of those options. What we do know is that more than one person per day dies on a road in New Zealand. Um, and this is not improving. Um, speed has proven to be a direct factor in, in most crashes we see across the country um, because the faster we go, the bigger the mess. That's something that we do know. But speed is something that council in our community can have a direct um, input into and consequently this review has some importance to our community. We're consulting because we need to change the, uh, the roading bylaw and this is, a, this is the opportunity for the community to have input and to start supporting that change. We think this speed review will be the biggest change that some of our community will see in a while. It's quite a big change and it will have, the, it will have impacts potentially on some of their day-to-day -day activities. I think some people will believe that the changes that are being proposed will have a greater impact, but David will hopefully be able to show some of those speed changes won't dramatically change their travel times. What we do believe is that from this um, the roads will become safer um, because we know that with less speed so the impact of, of crashes decreases. What we are proposing in general terms is um, some changes around schools, some changes for our unsealed roads, for our rural sealed roads, but we aren't proposing in the, at the moment to actually change any of our 50 kilometre an hour roads. Brief comments about our recommendation and we can work a little bit deeper into those later on. Um, recommendation 5 really just sets out the principles that we're actually suggesting that Council look to adopt. Um, that, sh 
that helps support decisions in the future. So we're not that those principles don't necessarily have any direct impact, but it will actually assist in future decision making. Recommendation six has quite a few um, sections to it, but that is actually the specific changes to those speeds so that we can take um, the, the, the direction from this meeting and actually prepare changes to the, the roading bylaw and return it at, for the May meetings for its consideration. And they are um, deliberately grouped by location or by type. So for instance, you'll see all the schools in one section um, and in the tables you'll see all the uh, unsealed roads where we're proposing to change those speed from 100. Section 7 is, so recommendation 7 deals with the roading bylaw. You will hopefully will recall that there were some elements of the bylaw. We had some small changes. Um, we had a submission that pointed out there were some grammatical and other minor changes to the bylaw which we think are helpful um, and we're proposing to change some of those. It also includes Don Street proposing it to go back to two-way. Um, I've called that out a little bit of our tidy up section and recommendations 8 to 10 are really changes um, that we don't want to miss. Um, some of them are to do with proposed subdivisions as we go forward, so Inverary and others. A little bit about consultation, what we, what we found. Um, I think the consultation we've run for this process is probably the most extensive um, consultation that I've seen um, dealing with any roading matter for, for since I've been around. Um, Hayden and Rhiannon's team um, have engaged widely um, through many opportunities, um, through Facebook, through meetings, and I do appreciate the uh, support we had from the councillors who came to those meetings and helped us um, through Adatara, through Morris Bush and all the other meetings, and it was really good. Um, we got a lot from those people. Sometimes there weren't lots of people at them, but they were certainly, that support was appreciated. I think there were 180, sorry, 198 submissions, and I guess from our viewpoint is um, how well is the community actually attached to us. We think that's um, a good representative sample. We have consulted with the bigger players, so people like um, Waka Katahi, the New Zealand Police, the AA, um, Heavy Haulage, those are organisations who have quite an this this change will have quite an impact on them. So, one of the things that we do want to start a conversation that actually talks about what is a safe and appropriate speed, and I think David will want to talk about that. And that's really what the basis of this is: what is the safe speed we should be driving on our roads? And rather than us talking about what's the legal speed limit, we should be actually starting to address what is the safe what is a safe and appropriate speed. So as I mentioned earlier, um, for our urban streets, we still believe those are streets where um, streets need to also be for people at the moment. They're very car dominated and we do actually need to start to think about and that's what the principles start to address. I think there's a big challenge to our wider pop population to actually understand what, um, what we're driving at and there will be some more communication needed. Schools, well we know that it was um, that's pretty much what we would describe as a no-brainer, um, that we actually have wide acceptance from it. I think we um, generally got uh, lots of support, um, variable speeds at school, so there are only those speed changes are only when the kids are coming in and out seems to be um, pretty well accepted as, as a good idea out there in the community. As I mentioned earlier, it will be from this meeting, your direction will be, will feed into that bylaw and we'll bring that um, bylaw back to the May Council for adoption. And I guess that's another opportunity to actually see and hear what's being proposed in there. We do recognise that we will need a reasonably significant communications plan that actually will work over time so that actually as we do things we can communicate it well to the community. Um, I think it's useful for David just to perhaps run through a couple of um, couple of examples for us to sort of explain how this, how we see this working, so it gives you a good bit of an insight. Thank you Russell. So just to jump into, back to section six, uh, where we've got all of our speed changes that we're looking to implement. Um, so to start off with one of those uh, is our rural sealed roads that generally speaking we are looking to drop them from 100 down to 80 k's an hour. 
uh, these are the ones that I think a lot of people uh, are thinking is going to impact oh, their Sorry, day. David, can you just bring the mic a wee bit closer? Thanks. Is that better? Yep. Perfect. Um, so these are the roads that we're looking uh, yeah, to reduce from 80 uh, down to 80 from 100. Uh, they're the roads that uh, everyone believes will increase their travel time by a lot. So to speak about the, the main one that's hot topic at the moment, which is Odotara Road, Bay Road, um, currently if the proposal along that section of road is 60 uh, from Duns Road through uh, until all of the residential stuff ends, which has got a lot busier with more driveways, more residents through there, and then 80k an hour uh, through to Bay Road and then Bay Road to stay uh, at 80k an hour back to the 50. What we are proposing is only going to add 38 seconds onto their travel time. So it's not actually adding a long time, it's adding 38 seconds uh, onto the travel time, but you're going to arrive where you're going to arrive to. So it's not actually uh, yeah, going to impact your day too much. Um, as Russell touched on before, uh, we need to learn about what the safe and appropriate speed is, not just the speed limit. The speed limit is what everyone in New Zealand has thought is the safe speed, but it's not with all the hazards that are on our roads. So the safe and appropriate speed is what we've chosen for uh, those types of roads. To go from there, the schools, uh, again, the schools are an easy win. Uh, we had a very uh, good number of people agreeing uh, that we need to do the schools and do the schools as soon as possible. Um, so these are gonna be at a variable speed limit of 30 outside of our urban schools with 60 outside of our rural schools. Um, to touch on one school in particular, or one section of road, Herbert Street outside Boys High, um, we understand that that's a very busy section. That already operates at below 30 k's an hour because it is extremely busy. We have pedestrians everywhere. Uh, the boys are just crossing uh, where they choose to. Um, the only thing that we need to understand from that area is we're actually going to impact the side roads. Um, so we're not going to impact Queen's Drive because that's uh, an important road for us. But all of the likes of Lewis Street, Ramrig Roads, uh, we're going to go about 150 metres into those roads as well. Um, so just understanding it's not going to be just the road that the school is on. There are going to be other side roads that will be impacted. Uh, and then to go to our shopping areas, um, shopping areas that we have of South City, CBD as well as uh, Windsor, uh, these places are already operating below the posted speed limit because they are very tight, very um, congested and those things. So the one to talk about here is South City. So at the moment we understand that there's a pedestrian crossing there that is um, not the nicest to uh, cross across because sometimes cars don't see you as they're driving. So uh, that is one of the reasons why that area is going to get a 30k an hour uh, speed limit through there, which also includes traffic calming at the same time. So we couldn't just implement a speed change. We'll do some speed bumps um, to help slow the traffic down to make it safer for those pedestrians crossing through there. Um, and then the fourth uh, part to do with our recommendation six, uh, is the rural gravel roads, which we're re reducing the majority from 100 down to 60. Um, and the area I'm going to talk about today is our rural bay road, uh, which is currently a 100k road uh, that we are looking to reduce uh, down to 60 with a section to 40. Um, the section that we've proposed at 40 is where the ratepayers have come in and we've got, I believe it's 16 out of 16 residents down there have asked for the section outside of their properties to be reduced to 40. Um, and due to everyone that lives there, there's actually no through traffic apart from the quarries. Um, we've suggested that as well as there's a 25k an hour bend in that section of road, so you shouldn't be travelling uh, over that 40 anyway. So um, the reason we're reducing the speeds on gravels uh, is, again, the safe and appropriate speed because that is where a lot of our crashes happen on gravel roads. Um, it also does a few other things for uh, the residents along there, like dust suppression and those kind of things. So. Okay, thank you for that. Um, just a question uh, regarding recommendation five. How, what, what would be the process for implementing one of the principles? Say you wanted to introduce that. Um, do you come back to this committee and, or do you just you just tell us it's happening type thing? Do you sort of request? Now, Mr. Mr. Chair, any change to the. Um, to a bylaw will require a formal resolution of right. coming back through council yeah. um, to actually get that approved. And I guess the, the principles really um, help 
start that conversation both with council. Uh, it gives the gives the elected members, um, I guess, a good understanding to be able to communicate to others that how it works. But it also gives good steer to the community what we where we're headed. Okay, uh, Councillor Ludlow. Thanks, Chair. Um, look, a question about Recommendation 9, which is the speed limit of 50 kilometres implemented for Te Pūawai. Um, does that take care of the submission we had uh, around the, the speed limit at the entrance to the Marae? I note your comments about footpaths, but it was the question about the speed limit. So I can touch on that one. So no, that does not specifically, but after the... Um, comments that we had, I have pushed the speed limit of the 50 past. Um, so as part of the proposal that you'll see at the next council meeting, it will be past the Marae. It won't just be at Macmillan, it'll be further along. So Thank that you. has been dealt with. Yep. Councillor Lewis. Thank you, Chair. David, just one, we did have a presentation by one lady who works at a school in, in, in North Winds in actual fact. In the schedule here, it's got 91 Chelmsford Street, which is the official front door address. <coughs> it is on the call. Uh, okay, uh, Councillor Lewis, can you Please, um, Sorry. there are some schools that have more than one street frontage through which children would, would enter. Uh, are you looking at the, at the whole queue for those sort of schools? Yes, so that's just uh, how I talked about those side streets. Absolutely, yeah. it's um, basically all of the school uh, roads around it will be, and you'll get maps at the uh, at the council meeting showing what the extents of so those are. So that particular are. school, one side is in Herbert Street? Yep, so Herbert Street, Windsor Street, as well yep. as Chelmsford Street. Thanks, David. Just need a clarification. Thank you. Thanks. Councillor Skelt. Thank you to you, Chair. Um, thanks, David and Russell, for a comprehensive report. Just from simplicity point of view, having read all the information, would it be moving forward from the, uh, the user, the road user, would it be easier if we simply just had a rural speed and a, and a city speed, as in two? as opposed to human behaviour is really interesting, how we all behave. And given the complication of variances, I'm just really interested in, you, in your knowledge because you've got a lot of history and a lot of experience going forward. Would that be a, would that be a reasonable way to move? Mr Chair, I think part of that is in the rural sense, you end up with sealed and unsealed, two different types yeah. of road surfaces. And I think that you actually, each of those areas you need to consider slightly differently. So, and I guess that's really why we would trying to um, have a reasonably static set like for unsealed roads at 60 but yeah. in specific cases you could vary it and, and sign those but in, in, all, in all essence we're really suggesting 60 on unsealed roads and 80 on the yeah. rural sealed roads and that is trying for, for, for Councillor Scout for exactly that try to keep it so we don't end up with a whole lot of variable speeds you know when you when you travel on a road the speed needs to be able, you need to be able to read what the environment you are in. And I guess that's with where in urban environments you've got to be able, it's got to tell you what you're supposed to be travelling at. So at the moment, um, 100 just feels too fast in some places. So really, if it's an 80k speed, you've got to, it's got to feel like 80. So people will, will naturally start to progress to that as we learn better driver behaviour. And I think that's everybody and their future drivers. So David, for the inner city, one particular speed would be? advantage the, the user? It, de it depends on the function of the street so again I agree with Russell. Functionality? Yeah yeah so it's it's about the readability of the street that if if you have one that has more place function then it should be a slower speed than the other it all depends how the um, the road does read. Yep. Thank you. Uh, thank you Councillor Scalp. Before I take Councillor Clark can I remind all all members that we have to have a mask on? Please. Um, yeah. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, Your Worship, we have to have a mask on in this room. Oh. Mm. I was going to be speaking. Sorry? I am mask exempt. Oh, are you mask oh. exempt? Right. I did not realise that. Okay, if you are exempt, that is fine. Well, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I felt that felt that there was. Well, no, really... but you. What, is this a question about the masks? No. no. Sorry. Is this a question about wearing a mask? Uh, no. No. I'm oh, sorry. I've got Councillor Clark next, and Councillor Arnold. And I can 
put you in the list after that, Your Worship. Oh, thank sorry. you. Council Clark, sorry about the delay. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a couple of issues. Uh, just commenting a little bit about uh, Councillor Skelt's issue about potentially having one rule for all in the rural areas. Um, as my, most of you will be aware, I've, I've done a, a rural delivery run, and, and when you start talking about um, sealed versus unsealed, and when you talk about unsealed, there are differences within the unsealed. And some roads you can quite nicely go down at 80 k's, and others are a nightmare at 40 and 50 k's. So I, I like the approach that we're doing it by by design on the roads. So just wanted to reinforce that. Um, have a couple of specific questions. Um, one is around the Marai um, footpath that was raised, Russell and David. Um, you, you mentioned in the report that. Uh, that portion of footpath could be about 100,000 k's. Um, and it talks about looking at other solutions, but I mean, I can't relate to what a 100,000 k, 100, k's uh, footpath actually looks like. Is that, would that be an excessive amount to extend a footpath? Uh, no, so the value was put there because there is also stormwater work that needs to be done. There is, okay. a, there is a large road ditch that needs to be sorted to be able to put a footpath there. So that is why it is okay. excessive for an urban footpath that you would see, but not in that instance. Okay. And Mr Chair, that's why we're suggesting there are alternatives because clearly um, what we're trying to promote is access to the Marae and whether there are some other internals that avoid having to pipe ditches and do those sorts of things that actually make better sense in terms of access is, is what that, I guess, the future, that design would look like to actually work collectively on that. So just a brief expansion on that. So given that the uh, new subdivision is going in a bit further down from the Marae, will there be some need to have a footpath coming right up past the Marae and back up to Regent Street at some later stage? Uh, Mr Chair, I'm not totally familiar with the, the design, but we do need to make sure we've got some decent accessibility and connections. That's the whole purpose. If we want to encourage active transport, we need to make sure that people can get to all the facilities. Um, I know that the um, proposal does connect nicely in through walkways onto Regent Street, so I'm also anticipating that there'll be the opportunity to connect up to Sky Street and the Marae. Okay, thank you. Uh, just, a, just a final reflection or really a question on, on page seven of board books, which talks about some of the risks that we have. Russell, uh, I just wanted to clarify, is, is the static um, speed camera on Otatara Road the only one we've got in town? Uh, Mr Chair, that's, that's correct. That's, that camera is the um, managed by the New Zealand Police currently. Okay. Why, why I asked that, Russell, is because we've got a lot of feedback in the, these submissions about people wanting us to focus quite a bit on education of drivers as opposed to just slapping new speed limits. And I just wondered how the enforcement agency, which would be the police, I guess, will, will cope with that sort of desire, or is it just going to be a, um, a mandate, mandated date when the, the, the limits will go from A to B? Mr Chair, we also have a degree of, um, I guess, interest in how the police will encourage the right behaviour from people and that's something that we've been having conversations with them about the need to actually, um, I guess, contribute to that education and also where necessary um, encourage and or have enforcement where, where people aren't um, meeting our expectations, I guess. so. Um, speed cameras are things that I know that NZTA or Waku Katahi have actually um, talked about bringing out more across the country, but they're typically um, volume based from them and, and they currently control where those cameras go. Sure. And just a last reflection for Russell and David. Uh, I think this is a really good piece of work. Um, and I think while we'll get resistance from some members of the community, we'll, we'll have that anyway. Um, and I was pleased that we left the um, urban limit at 50 at this stage, but with the potential to review at a later stage. I think that was an excellent piece of uh, piece of work as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clark. Councillor Arnold. Yeah, I've got a couple of, couple of questions too, Russell. Um, mind that we're all uh, can we just um, just go a wee bit faster? Thank you. Bear in mind that we um, we're always wanting public consultation and participation in council affairs. The fact that 
didn't want any change at all, and 67% uh, um, didn't want the uh, country roads to go below 80, uh, if you combine that with them. And then, uh, have you taken that into account at all in any of your um, what your recommendations? Um, Mr. Chair, we've, we've looked closely at the, a, a, the number of submissions, and I guess we also see quite often the silent majority. Um, but we've also looked at what those people's submissions were relating to, whether it was um, their travel time or those sorts of things. And I guess that's what people's perceptions are very much, that us changing the speed limit will actually have a huge adverse effect on their travel time, whereas um, the information and data that we have shows that their current travel speeds are actually slower than the speed limit anyway. Okay, I just uh, think. Um, with the um, proposal that you might have uh, various speed limits in town, you know, like 30, 40, 50 in different streets, do you not think that, just like what happened with Otara, when signs were missed, um, you might get people missing signs, like they, they, they might be thinking about something else and not see the sign that says this road's actually 40, and suddenly they, they perhaps a ticket for doing 50 if there's no cars around. Bear in mind, I do drive a lot on the roads around town, myself personally, and at times there are no cars, and 50 is quite a safe speed. Um, yeah, uh, like, uh, what would you call it, sign fatigue or something? Um, um, not Mr. knowing? Mr Chair, it's a, really, it's a really good question about, but once again it comes back to that statement that it says that our streets need to read the speed to travelling. So for instance, the speeds we have for the city centre changes as in S Street at one speed and um, Don and parts of Calvin Street being proposed at 30 k's, those streets, when you drive down them, you need to, the, those streets need to, to look like that speed. Um, whereas at the moment, the rest of our roads that are big and wide look like the 50 k's. So that's partly what drive was driving our um, suggestion that we leave them there. And if in the future, the, the um, I guess the community seeks for a lower speed in, in their residential areas, we will also need to address that to make sure that as you drive off the main road into a residential street, that the, those areas have other treatments as part of an ongoing program that actually make you feel like you're driving there and you want to slow down because you're expecting kids to be playing in the street. You know, So for instance, if you're driving down Queen's Drive, um, you wouldn't expect kids necessarily to be playing all over it, but if you're turning off Queen's Drive into a residential street through some traffic calming, you would you would naturally change your speed down. So I'd, I think the signage will be one thing. Um, unfortunately, um, we do have a lot of signs, and I guess that's why we are quite particular about um, limiting the number of signs out there. But once again, it's just a factor of, I guess, our, our driving ability that we need to be observant of what speed limits there are. And future cars, I am absolutely certain, will have some devices to tell you that you're actually travelling too fast in an area. A driver. Um, I, I think the technology could be a great help in the future. Also, um, do you have any statistics on... You know, in, in arriving at your suggestions, and, and I actually agree with some of them, don't get me wrong, I'm not all negative here, but um, what percentage just relies on, you know, like, of the accidents and fatalities and things re actually are contributed by just bad behaviour and irrespective of any signage, uh, would that go away? Do you have a statistic on that, like what percentage of accidents are contributed to actually bad behaviour and perhaps which could be fixed by education and or bigger penalties or something? One of the things that we see is that um, I guess the, the approach to crashes nowadays isn't necessary to find the person, the, the reason at fault. Um, I guess all crashes have a number of contributing factors so often and the investigations from the police that they undertake, they attribute it to a number of factors and one of the things that we, and you're right, some, some of it is that driver inattention but speed seems speed is one of those things that keeps reappearing. Certainly, in a rural sense, speed well, I'm is. What I'm trying to get at here, Russell, is would signage fix that with those particular people? Because I would, I would, I think I had a statistic actually. Uh, I can't find it at the moment, but it says that it wouldn't actually change that much. No signage won't. Signage itself won't is, change bad behaviour. It it, it it assists a number of people, but I guess some of the people who don't obey the current speed are highly unlikely to obey a new speed, but as part of a driving behaviour we'll actually get there if we actually start this process. Second to last question, um, 
CSDC aren't doing anything with the, at, at, at currently with the gravel roads. At, I mean, I kind of agree with slowing down the speeds on gravel roads, to be fair. I mean, I'd very rarely ever drive it 100. Well, I'd ne I never would, in fact. Would it not be an idea to actually do it in conjunction with them so that there was no, so like, you know, you're nodding, that's going to happen? Uh, I'm sorry. Um, yes, so we have engaged with uh, SDC about it, but no, they are not looking uh, at doing the area-wide speed limit review anytime soon. They've been out recently and they've got feedback that they don't want to go back to an area-wide. Um, the bigger difference between our gravel roads and their gravel roads are the distances. So their gravel roads are actually used as arterials or like routes, whereas for us ours are just yeah, connecting Some roads. Some people, though, to be fair, wouldn't know if they're ours or theirs. You know, what I, you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah. So that's not. They, they go into each yeah. other. Yeah. So that's also the same as the sealed roads. All of those connecting roads, whether it be to Wakakotahi State Highway Network or our CSTC's network, um, unfortunately, there are going to be signs that are put up there because the only way we'd be able to do that cleanly is do the whole South Island in one go, and we just won't be able to do that. So that's why we have spoken with those other stakeholders, and unfortunately, well, at this time. Yep. Where roads go into their roads yep. in places, and so you're going to have a different speed, yeah, different speed. Yep. on the same road. Yeah, I, I do in see conditions. Yep. I do see there's a, there'll be a growing challenge across all the local authorities to address speed. Um, that certainly is something that's on high on the um, Mokokote and, and the government's interest of how do we actually reduce our um, road deaths and speed is, 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 is one of those key levers that we have relatively easy access to to deal with. Um, so. SDCs, um, they dealt with their hotspots through t through the I guess the change in speed from um, highways into their towns and stuff. But they will have a wider question and two more questions, quick questions. One of them's almost a. Uh, you must have noticed that the, the Windsor speed humps. Is there any uh, thought to, to to do those? You may have actually mentioned that a minute ago. I think did you in the South City, because they actually work, don't they? Because you couldn't drive through there at more than thirty k's, otherwise your car would have no suspension. I would. I'd call them platforms. David might call them speed bumps. Oh, well, they're sort of platforms. Yep. You're up and down, up, both ways. You know. We you know. we want to manage. We want to manage the speed. So as you you enter those areas, that you you, it makes sense to slow down to drive over them. Interestingly, the people of uh, the Windsor area have learnt over the um, twenty something years they've been there. Um, so it's a it's interesting. Their speed was reduced quite greatly, but people have got cunning in the last little while and I have learned how to drive them a bit faster but that's just the style of platform. Still you over 30 because yes, so you'd and it's quite, it's quite effective. What about, um, is there any, they're not pedestrian crossings but some people mistake those for pedestrian crossings, they think they're safe to cross here but it's actually not. Is there so, any thought to so, add pedestrian crossings to those? Or? Uh, so that's really what that 30 k's an hour is as well, that it's to try and make it a pedestrian space so that the street is for people, not just the vehicles. At 30 k's an hour, um, the risk of a serious or death accident if you were hit by a car is extremely low. Compared to 40, it's very high. But there is um, only one pedestrian crossing. Yeah, and that's up in the new world. So Four it's blocks. to try and make it almost a shared space so that people do, do, do feel as if they can cross. But yes, we do understand that there are some confusion about where to cross along there. Can I be really clear? The speed platforms at Windsor are not pedestrian crossings, and yeah. and have a pedestrian crossing in the Windsor area will need them to be mid block like the other one, and yeah. and unfortunately as a consequence of that, you need visibility for those crossings, which reduces parking, and that's the original um, concern the um, retailers had some years ago. So. Okay. But and I guess it's we do get that periodically where people suggest that it's um they get uh, confused, but it really needs to be emphasised they are not pedestrian crossings. Yeah, thanks, Russell. That's all I've got at the moment. Okay. okay. Uh, next is uh, your worship, followed by Councillor Abbott. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. The um, uh, there is obvious that no brain is like schools and that and. There's obviously a lot of support for that, but um, it seems to me I I can't help agreeing a bit with um, Councillor Arnold that there's not really a significant demand to radicalise changes that this um, report suggests. Councillor Abbott. 
Oh, thank you for that. Uh, I just have a quick question. I noted that uh, over a period of time, I think it might be four to five years, uh, costs incurred could amount to about $20 million. I'm just interested to know that uh, we as a city, would we qualify for any subsidy from um, national government? Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. We looked at that cost and we would believe that's a contribution we would need to put in forward programs should you want to um, implement 40 kilometre an hour across all of your residential streets. And that's the cost that we would anticipate putting some calming at all of the intersections. I think you would uh, look at how you would manage that because that's a pretty significant sum of money over a period of time. Um, the short answer is yes, we would hope that would be subsidised if we can get it into a programme and get it approved. Right, thank you for that. Okay, any further questions, comments? So, yes, Councillor Lalo. Sorry, we've moved to comments. Um, initially, I was of a similar mind as Councillor Skelton that I, I thought the easiest way through the problem is to have some sense of uniformity. Um, one of the challenges that that presents is the likes of Crescents, an unmarked Crescent like um, uh, Comai Crescent, where legally you could head around there at 50 kilometres per hour now and yet you can have parking on both sides and there's really, once there's cars on both sides of the road, only sufficient room for one vehicle to go through. And for a vehicle to navigate that at 50 kilometres per hour is hazardous. And that's just one example of the street. So I saw good sense in, in trying to find um, a way of dealing with that issue. Uh, we had really good feedback from people around the, the schools. Um, there was an excellent submission from the Youth Council. Their suggestion, I thought, had, had a degree of merit in it. And, in saying 20 kilometres per hour past schools because that's the speed limit that you've got to go past a bus at. That said, the number of times I'm travelling past those buses at 20 k's and there's still vehicles whizzing past me in two lanes is, well, it hasn't happened since this morning. Uh, it's a nice personalised plate, but I won't drop that in the meeting. Um, so bringing the, the levels down differently in, in the rural zone to the urban zone actually, actually makes good sense. Councillor Arnold makes a good point in that with speed, quite often we're preaching to the converted uh, and that there are people who will follow a speed limit and there are, are those drivers who feel that they are better than that and have tremendous control of a car, um, but that's why they're called accidents because nobody intends for them to happen. And, and sometimes that can be as a result of road conditions. <clears throat> you know, we're in the middle of the drought at, at the moment and all it'll take is the first rain and all the oil that's built up on the roads over the past several weeks without rain suddenly turns them into a nice skating rink. Uh, and so there are those unseen risks that people aren't aware of. And it's bringing all that into mind along with the, the submissions that, that we heard in here a couple of weeks ago, I can see some sense in, in making the changes. Um, I'm not sure whether it's a good thing or a bad thing that it's occurred at the same time as there's a national highways review going on. I guess there's, there's, it increases awareness, but people might confuse what we're doing on a, on a local scale with that. And, and actually, I guess at a high level, the principles are the same in the rationale behind it. But it is, it is a significant move. I mean, the last time I remember speed limits being discussed, we changed from miles to kilometres. Uh, which is a few years ago for those of us who, who remember that. Um, I mean, I, I'm supportive of it. It's, it's taken me a while to wrestle with it and come to terms with it, but it's going to be a staged process, and I don't think we're going to get instantaneous compliance. It's, it's good that we have been talking with the likes of uh, the other stakeholders. It's up to police to enforce it, not us. Um, interesting feedback from St John, who talked about the route to... Uh, the hospital uh, down Ellis Road, picking up on the points that were made by the Youth Council in response times. Disappointing that uh, Fire and Emergency New Zealand didn't get back to us, but you know, I think we've got a good indication from St John anyway. So there are, there, there are these issues that we've that we are taking into account, and in, in what is a significant change. Um, there was a good number of people who who put some thought into the submissions and. It, 
like I said, I don't think we'll see instant change, but we're looking at a behavioral change. And at some point, it's got to start somewhere and just trying to educate is, is not enough because I've been trying that for years. We'll still be educating, I venture to guess, because it's not us that's that's writing the tickets. And police over the first while will still be talking to people to make sure that they're aware. But it does actually create an increased burden on the driver, uh, who in theory is phenomenally aware of everything that's going on around them, not their phones, not adjusting their sound systems. But having a, a young learner driver in the house at the moment who's waiting to do his test and having to constantly look not only for all the hazards that they are now and remembering what's right and what's not but there's an additional burden there that says and by the way when you're moving down uh, into some streets there's a, there's a different speed limit that said the easiest guide is how narrow has that street just gotten because if it's become more narrow, odds are it's going to be a slower speed limit. So it'll be a period of adjustment, um, and and I think it's a it's a bold but needed leadership um, move that's going to come from council if we get this through. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Councillor Amundsen, and then Councillor Arnold. Thanks, Chair. Um, Looking at these principles, I think that they really do hit the mark. Um, at the end of the day, if we uh, want our city to be a city that is pedestrian friendly, is cyclist friendly and is family friendly, um, then I think these are all um, great moves. And I think, you know, 40Ks might take people a wee while to um, get used to, um, but I think that actually it's... It's something that will help keep our kids much safer, make it, um, you know, thinking back to when uh, COVID was around and we were in lockdown and there were families biking and walking their dogs and taking their kids to the park on foot. You know, it was great to see so many people outside and enjoying um, the city. And I think that this is a way that we can start to bring that back. Councillor Allen. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to remind, I appreciate what all my colleagues are saying here, but I'd like to write, even though they look like a target, I'd like to remind people that signs aren't targets, they're a speed limit. That is the top speed you can go, not the bottom speed. So uh, I think, you know, we've got, to re we've got to apply common sense. All drivers should apply common sense. If you don't apply common sense, seriously, you shouldn't be driving. To me, it's a, a matter of education and penalties, uh, not signage. I mean, $20 million is a, is a lot, but it's over a few years, I appreciate that. But. But just remember, they do look like targets, but they're, that's the top speed, that's the speed limit, not the bottom. Hey, Ms. Scott. So just first of all, Mr. Chair, to confess that um, I've never actually driven a car except with a driving instructor beside my side, and we mutually agreed that it was, was not a good idea that I drive. <laughs> However, having said that, I've been a lifetime pedestrian, and an occasional cyclist. And I want to comment on what I see that we are doing, and that is reprioritising what we do within our city limits. Um, also, the, I appreciate we're also looking at the rural and gravel roads, but particularly within the city, and saying that getting to somewhere as fast as you can is not necessarily the best thing that the residents of the city should be aiming for. Because when you're doing that, you're not actually focusing on where you are and what your purpose is. You're so busy trying to get there faster than the guy in the next lane. Um, the risk taking that's involved with that. But I really want to say how delighted I am that we are looking at our neighbourhoods and saying that our neighbourhoods are actually for people who are not just in cars but are walking, bicycling, on their mobility scooters, all those sorts of things because that's the true people of our community. That is what we should be doing is actually being in our community and taking the time to be in our community, not rushing from here to there. So if this slows us down 38 seconds in a day, so what? 38 seconds 
half a minute, we need to take the time. And if, if people are so impatient that they cannot add a minute to their trip to the supermarket or a minute to their trip to work, there's something the matter with our thought processes and the lives that we are living. So I want to thank the council and the council officers for their leadership in this matter, because sometimes we do have to be the leaders, not the followers. Thank you. Okay. Um, right, I'd just like to comment that, that this does, these recommendations do show common sense in the fact of environmental awareness of the driver, which is great. I also like to comment on the speed reduction on gravel roads. I think that is long overdue. We've had over the years, I've been on council, many um, separate submissions from the public about dust, corrugations and damage to gravel roads. Dropping them down to 60 is going to make them last longer and reduce those effects. So I, I welcome that. Now I'm going to put these recommendations, but uh, I, I think after all this discussion, I'm prepared to put them all as one group. Does anyone object to that? They can speak up. You object to that? You want to go through them one by one? I agree with some of them, but I don't agree with all of them. Yeah. Okay. Would you like to go through them one by one? Oh, please. Yeah. Okay. Right. Let me get to those recommendations. Okay. I'm going to. Uh, group one, two, three, and four. Okay, so can I have someone move those? They moved Councillor Ludlow, seconded Councillor Skelt for recommendations one, two, three, and four. I'll put that. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Okay, one, two, three, and four. Okay, we're going to go to recommendation five now, and that is to resolve to adopt the following speed principles to guide council's decision making on speed and that incorporates A, A through to L. Bex, you're moving that. Seconded, uh, Ms Cook. Right, discussion on that? We've already had discussion, but... Had discussion. Well, yeah, I was just gonna say we've pretty much had our discussions. Um, so these are the mind, principles. Bearing in mind that um, our public 60% voted for no change. I feel that I'm going to be against this going forward. You're against the principles? Yeah. These you're going as to realise? I don't agree. With, I agree with some of them, but the way they're written as a group, uh, Christian five, uh, I'd have to go against it. Okay. Right out. In fact, that 60% of air. Okay, that's been moved and seconded. I'm going to put that motion. All those in favour? Aye. 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 And against, Aye. Councillor Arnold. That's carried. I'm now going to go to recommendation six. I'll move. Moved, Councillor Abbott. Seconded, Councillor Ludlow. Right, I'm going to put the motion. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? That's carried. Right. I'm going to go the rest of the recommendations. Uh, Councillor Arnold, do you, Very good with the rest you're all good with those. So that's right. I'm going to put, uh, can someone please move 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11? That's Ms. Coote. Seconded, Councillor Skelt. We'll put those motions, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Aye. They are carried. Now, thank you very much, everybody, for that. And uh, that is well timed. Um, to start the infrastructure meeting at three. Uh, no further, no further work. So the, the meeting is ended. Thank you, thank you, David, and thank you, Russell.
Right, we, we're beginning live streaming. Alan. So, welcome to the Infrastructural Services Committee. Once I find it here. Okay, we have um, apologies for this meeting again from, uh, I think we're going to have uh, Councillor Soprin is streaming, so the apologies are from Councillor Crackett and Councillor Kett. Moved. And that is all. Uh, moved, Councillor Abbott, seconded. Councillor Lewis, I can put those apologies. All those in favour? Aye. 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 That is carried. That moves on to the first minutes um, of the March March 1 meeting. Uh, someone move that they true and correct? I'd like to move that, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Lewis. Seconded, Ms Coote. I'll put that motion. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. That is carried. Uh, minutes of the extraordinary meeting, 15th March. Moved, Chair. Second those. Moved, Councillor Ludlow. Seconded, Councillor Sofa. Put that. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against. Aye. That is carried. Minutes of the extraordinary meeting, Tuesday, 22nd of March. Moved. Moved, Councillor Ludlow. Seconded, Councillor Hamilton. Put that motion. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against that is carried. That brings us now on to an update on the search for an emergency water supply. Alistair, would you like to take a seat up the front? Aye. Welcome, Alistair. Pull up a chair and a microphone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll get you to bring the microphone a wee bit closer to you. Thanks for that. Oh, and you may take your mask off to speak if you wish. Thank you. Uh, well, this report's been prepared just to update councillors on the progress where we, we've been made, made looking for an emergency water supply, an alternative water supply to act for emergencies. Um, Pleased to say that we have actually located a suitable underground source, although the testing didn't go quite according to uh, plan. We did have some difficulties, but we can summarise by saying we have found a suitable source. Its yield is good and its quality is better than we would have thought. However, um, to ascertain the properties of the supply, the pumping test we conducted wasn't sufficient. We had failure of equipment and we're going to have to repeat that pump test again. Uh, so I think at that point I'll just stop and if, um, if there are any questions from councillors, I'll answer. Okay, thank you, Alistair. Um, right, questions, councillors? Well, Your Worship. Thank you. Um, that's that's a great great news actually that we found a source it is not to be scoffed at after 20 or so years and it's arrived in the nick of time by the sounds of it too is is that cause or is it a bore or what is the actual physical location alistair yes it's an underground source located at Awarua, the Awarua Plains, um, just off um, Awarua Siding Road, about two and a half kilometres um, east of the Bluff Highway uh, and south of the um, Awarua Radio Village. Um, I've got Councillor Clark next, then Councillor Arnold. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just, just one question. In the report, it talks I was doing a little bit about um, the future connection of the water supply into the into the main system, I guess, as opposed to it being there for uh, emergency services only. But surely both would, would need some sort of connection to a mainframe, wouldn't it? Uh, yes, Councillor Clark, you are correct. Um, when we first considered the um, 
looking for an, an alternative source. We didn't know where it was going to be, so we were unable to work out the um, connection of that supply to our network. Now that we know where it is, <coughs> we can investigate how we would connect it. So uh, I just want just just final clarification on that. So that is the pathway we would like to go down. So if, if for argument's sake um, we do connect it up, and that's that's the way we go, will we be drawing from that drill site, or would that just be an emergency purpose, or would we have it in the main system and take away the potential um, draw that we get off the Ariti River? Um, right. The first aim of this investigation was to locate a water source to take away the risk we have of being solely dependent on the Ariti River. Um, uh, how we connect it, whether it be an emergency source or something that's working day by day, it is not an issue. We have to connect it somehow. and. Probably the thinking which needs to be quantified yet is that we should really bring it back to one of our, our, our main pump station here in the city. We have to do some um, logic thinking on that, but just to connect it into the nearest pipeline, which is the Bluff pipeline, is not good enough. It, this has, has to be some investigation and consideration as to how we would implement this supply, be it an emergency source or a full-time working water source into our network. And just one final question, I guess, which is in relation to what you just raised about the potential for it to come into the bluff pipeline. Um, I guess you'll have seen on the radar for the future that uh, uh, aquaculture is looking to have a hatchery potentially in, um, in uh, bluff that would need uh, some additional need of fresh water. Um, as would potentially any green hydrogen uh, development in that area as well. So is, is that another option that we could look to? Because currently our system, I understand, that goes to bluff, doesn't have a lot more capacity to increase the volumes. Am I right in assuming that? Yes, it is. And the choke point there is the capacity of the existing pipeline. Sure. And so if you were to connect this second, this new supply direct into that pipeline, to quite a large degree, that choke would still exist. Okay. Thanks, mate. Um, yeah. Okay, Welcome. Councillor Lewis. Yes, Councillor. please do. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. It might, might seem a silly question, but the two bores only 200 metres or whatever apart, differences in the water supply, does that infer in the, in, in the, are effectively two aquafilter buckets side by side, or are they, are they quite extensive? Um, I've been told by the experts that it's not uncommon to have some difference in water quality, even from bores that are close together, but they were, for all intents and purposes, drawing from the same aquifer. Mm. And obviously you can't put, put a, a stick down to see how deep they are in the indication how you hit the water from the 200 metres, whatever, from the surface. Is there any indication apart from the the lack of movement or the filling rate after the so many days of pumping? Is there any indication how deep they are? Because further north from here, I know some of the cities, Christchurch, for example, the aquifer has been drained out, and and they some of the people have put extensive bores back in to try and maintain the same water supply. Any indication how deep the the water is likely to be effectively deeper. Uh, no, I, I suppose this, that really touches on my comment in the report that if we were to <coughs> utilise this supply for anything other than emergencies, such as a working uh, bore day in, day out, we would have to conduct more extensive testing than we are at the moment. I think the system that we're looking at now, uh, the chat and formation, is not necessarily a strata that's yeah. uniform yeah. over its whole extent. Mm. It's probably in, I'm probably not describing this correctly, but pools, yeah. and they'll be connected by uh, underground canals yes. whose capacity we don't know. So just how the aquifer would perform under continuous day-by-day, uh, year-in-year-out operation would need to be tested by more extensive testing than we've designed for at the moment. And also... 
even if it's an emergency supply, you can't have it sitting there um, in a state of not being used or tested on a regular basis because, as we all know, anything that you rely on for emergencies has to be checked periodically to make sure it does fire when you need it. Thank you, Mr Murray. This, right, we've made the clarification that I really wanted you to say so people don't jump to the conclusion we've got unlimited water supply suddenly on tap. Thank you. Do I have a question? Uh, Councillor Abbott. Yes, um, just uh, being um, recognition of the three waters criteria, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if we would either have emergency supply or be connected to the main lines, what provision is made for treatment? Uh, yes, we have in the study considered the treatment requirement. Um, initially, we thought it would have to be quite extensive treatment, um, particularly in relation to uh, hardness removal. A lot of bore waters are very hard, and that's easiest to um, describe in terms of a consumer that you get fur on the inside of your kettle, very hard to get a soap lather, etc. And that hardness has to be removed. So there's a reasonable cost in doing that. But um, from the testing we've done to date, the hardness element of the water is much better than we could have expected. So that requirement for treatment has been removed. We would still have to uh, chlorinate the water and do some other minor treatment, but nothing to the degree that we had thought earlier. Right, thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, at this stage, have you any idea about the recharge for, from that aquifer? Because this, you won't have tested it for long enough to know whether it's a slow recharge or, you know, almost instant, so to speak. Um, what will you have to do to assess that? Well, in conducting a pumping test, I mean, there are other water bearing stratas above this one. This particular strata is at 200, just over 200 metres below ground level. So it's deep and it's likely that the recharge system is slow rather than fast track such as the TY one is. Um, we had hoped to monitor the water levels in the um, uh, overbearing strata above, but as I mentioned in the report, through a combination of equipment failure and uh, blinding off one of the tappings into the one of the upper stratas, we couldn't measure that. So we've got to go back and repeat the testing and monitor the water levels above the strata we're interested in. But you suspect it's slow, slow recharge rather than anything yes. different? Yes. Yeah. One of the benefits of an underground supply as opposed to a river supply is that you're not subject to the seasonal variations which we're currently experiencing. Thank you. Councillor Clark, is that hand still up oh. from last time? Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, Sorry. Any, other, any other questions for Alistair? Okay. Happy to move the recommendations, Mr Chair. Uh, thank you. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Lewis. Um, so we have uh, the recommendations are to receive this report that we improve the investigation into um, the potential develop the Chant Formation Aquifer and also approve the investigation on how we connect it to the system. So, moved and seconded. I'll put that. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against. That motion is carried. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Alistair. Yeah. Takes us to the activities report. And uh, on the menu tonight, we've got pool, parks, joints, uh, joint agency training day, parks week, pop-up play update, umbrella, installation, water supply restrictions, stock bank upgrade critical milestone, Branksome treatment plant seismic strengthening, tree roots interfering with stormwater, and the Gala Street reserve tank roofs. So what would you like to cover, Steve? Thank you, Mr Chair. I think you've taken my thunder. <laughs> Um, look, I, I just would like to make a couple of points. Um, the effort the team at Splash Palace have undertaken 
in terms of increasing participation rates at the swim score has been really outstanding. Starting off at about 470, we now um, can now report we're well over 600 um, young people and adults engaging in Learn to Swim at Splash Palace. And when you look at the context of the participation data generally, that's actually a really good result. But as we know, and as I've been reporting, the amount of effort they are going through in order to get more people through the door is increasing um, with the COVID uh, restrictions also changing, but um, with COVID in our community too. So just a hats off to the Splash Palace team there. Uh, I just want to make one other point around the Hydra slide. There's reference to um, some remedial works on the Hydra slide. just want to say that that is related to the old Hydra slide which is under the dive towers. And so we're just fixing that uh, concrete block up, block up. It was slightly bigger than the team anticipated when we were pulling it out. And so we've just got to do a little bit more remedial work, but happy to take any questions on the leisure and rec services. Right, any questions regarding Steve? Councillor Arnold. Um, you've never thought of putting an elevator up the hydro slide for more mature people to Go up and down the stairs and have multiple goes, have you? Any, any, any um, look, it, it's on the surface. Oh, no, sorry. I'll start again, Councillor. Very good question. Um, <laughs> it is, it's a, it's a tough one because actually a number of councils have considered this from an accessibility point of view. Um, and I understand the Metro Sport Facility is looking at that uh, in Christchurch. Uh, where we get into some uh, challenge though is it's the warranties and the rules and conditions that the slide manufacturer impose on the users of the slide that um, we we would really seriously need to consider um, how we manage that uh, by making it more accessible we might actually be creating another risk as users of the slide go down and for those who've been down the slide and hopefully you're one of them um, it's quite an exciting ride that throws you around a bit Yeah, yeah. But you do, I think, um, as the, when the Mayor opened this last year, we did talk about how many meat pies you burn in terms of calories for how many rides on the slide. So it is very good for your health and well-being. Councillor Clark. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, just one question for Steve, the old uh, perennial one. Uh, any update on uh, Anderson's house, how that's going uh, on the restrengthening and also whether there's any progress around Anderson House about a potential use for it post strengthening. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. In terms of Anderson House's capital program, uh, we're on track there uh, and Erin might want to add any more points. Uh, in terms of an update, we hope to be bringing a short update back to the PPP committee next week uh, with a more full paper on the operational plan in May. Thank you. Did you want to comment, Erin? Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the main one that I'd just like to comment on, and I might actually put Alistair on the spot just around water restrictions rather than me reiterating to you what he's already told me. Um, but Alistair, are you happy just to give the elected members a quick update on when we think we might have to move to that next restriction level? Um, if we don't get rain, yes, you'll need to go back to the speaker. From a, meet, from a meeting I attended um, this morning, uh, the predictions were that if we didn't get rain, we would have to uh, impose the second restriction. Um, I think it was uh, by by Sunday, the tenth. Yeah, the tenth of uh, this month. But those that were at the meeting, and that included the uh, environment, south and hydrologist, was reasonably confident that we would be getting rain uh, overnight. And while it's further out, the weather forecasts they're not guarantees, but um, it's likely that we will get some rain next week as well. But if we don't get rain, 
and we'll know that by Friday um, we could have restrictions, the second level restrictions in on Sunday. Alistair, what are those second level of restrictions? Again, they relate purely to the domestic properties and it, the second ban is to ban all outside domestic use, so the likes of cleaning cars and even holding a hose in the hand is not allowed. Right. Okay. Um, the question regarding where the rain lands. Now, we've got two sort of dilemmas. We've, we've got people who need uh, rain on their roofs to fill up their tanks, which is local rain. Then, obviously, to get those cumic levels up in the flow, we need the water into the headwaters of the Areti. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, um, looking at the weather charts myself, um, North Mavora, all around there, seems to be getting a lot of rain soon. Is that uh, is that right, that we need it in the further upstream rather than just locally as well? Yes, the Areti River's um, recharged throughout its whole catchment length, and that extends well beyond the um, limits of the Invercargill City Council. So the weather forecasts that I've seen are that there will be rain further north of Invercargill as well to recharge the river throughout its whole length. But even so, um, that recharge will be short-lived. It'll have to be supported by other rainfall events in order to sustain the recovery. It's not just one rainfall, rainfall event that will help us. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, Councillor Clark again. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just for Alistair again, uh, you'll be aware that I sat in on the uh, Southern Regional Leadership Group, which discussed this uh, last week. Um, and the Met Service advice we got there that we, was that we'd only get um, less than five mils on Tuesday, which is today, and nothing till about next Wednesday. But clearly that landscape's now changed, hasn't it? Because there's, they're forecasting much heavier rain in the next couple of days. That's correct, up to about 20 mils. But again, they are forecasts, they're not guarantees, and we won't know what we've got until Thursday, Friday of this week. Okay, thank you. Right, further questions for Alistair while he's here. No, thank you, Alistair, again. Any other... Yeah, sorry, I Chair, had one. Can I just re respond to the point from Councillor Clark yeah. on Anderson House? Um, just as an awareness that um, we are, we do have a potential issue that may give us a delay of a matter of weeks on Anderson House. We are just working through it at the moment, but it's to do with reinstatement of a section of the roof. Um, we are working with Heritage Architects on that um, and whether or not that needs to be a particular product which may slow down um, that that section of of the work, um, hoping that we can come to an easy agreement and not have that delay. But we're just resolving that at the moment. Thank you, Erin. Um, Councillor Abbott, sorry for missing you. That's okay. That's okay. Um, I, I think it's relevant to Alistair. I'm not sure if it comes under his jurisdiction or not. But I'm just looking at the Garland Street circular res, res, reservoirs. Um, roofs and uh, reading that and interested i just wondered practically um if it were to have vents through that uh, shallow concrete um, covering but have vents would that not achieve the purpose of no gas build up and then could the uh, roofs be painted with a semi permeable paint Alistair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, an answer to Councillor Abbott's suggestion. Uh, no, I don't think it would. If you look at the um, circular reservoirs, you'll see that there are vents in the walls. Yeah. Um, and I doubt whether you'd get sufficient aeration by putting uh, vents in the roof elements themselves. Right. Just a thought. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Arnold. Alistair, yeah, just on the, on the same issue, um, when I was reading that, the first thing that occurred to me was what about just a plain concrete roof? Like water blasting the paint completely off and leaving it grey? Yes, that, that is an option, having no paint covering at all. Um, okay, looks fine. Yeah. 
if you if we did do that, we would have a maintenance program, um, an annual maintenance program to keep it free of uh, slime and um, algae growth, or spraying it to keep the, um, the 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 algal growth down. But it is an option. Yeah. Further questions or comments or about the the other subjects we have on the activity report? Yes, Your Worship. Yes, um, it's a bit left of field, but it, I was coming down from Christchurch and there was a huge lake there, and they said it's um, boosted house values around it, and they do water skiing. And I wondered if that option had been looked at for where. Um, Are you talking, Your Worship, about a um, man-made facility for the water supply? Yeah. I think it was, what's the town south of Christchurch? Ashburton. 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 Lake Hood. Lake Hood, Lake Hood yeah. It's pretty big. Mm. Did that hold out for the, or is it facing a crisis just like we are now? I mean, no? um, well, there are several cities throughout New Zealand that do have what they call impoundment dams, which are man-made lakes for the purposes of water supply. Wellington has them. Um, several cities have them. Um, they cost quite a bit of money to prepare, and they're of a finite volume. In my argument, well, more applicable, I suppose, to a man-made super reservoir, um, is that they, the cost of doing that is significant. And it's also it's a finite volume where by if we an underground supply is likely to have a volume much larger than a man made lake. Um the Neden it does seem rather deep though, doesn't it? it? It certainly is. But that depth does give us protection against um contamination from activity above. Um with the lakes you can have issues with stratification in them. The Wellington Lakes do from time to time, calling, uh, causing taste and odour issues. Um, there are problems to be overcome no matter which system you use. We've elected to go and search for an underground supply. It represented the best value for money at the time. And of course, if we were unsuccessful in finding an underground supply, then we'd have to examine other alternatives. But so far, the investigation has proven that it looks likely that we can use an underground supply. Thank you. I see the, uh, I see the occasional update on the Tasman project. Um, it's a sort of a storage system. Mm -hmm. Is that right, Alistair? Is it storage? Yes, it's a uh, rather large impoundment dam meant for irrigation and for water supply for the uh, Nelson region. And uh, its latest update price is 180 million. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I think we keep drilling. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, Councillor Abbott. No, no, I'm all good, thanks. Oh, okay. Well, thank you once again, Alistair. There are another couple of um, items on the activity report if you wanted me to talk to while I was here. Right. Look, we'll go for that. You want to talk about the... Um, you don't, you're not doing the tree roots? No, no. Um, uh, the strengthening of Brank's home? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, that's a project that my colleague, uh, Mr Keane, has been involved in, but it's funded by in part by the um, uh, Ministry of Business and Innovation as a part of the payment given to us for the RFI exercise done um, January of 2021. You might recall that um, we, Council were advanced funds for various projects and that was one we put up. Um, it represents strengthening of other critical elements of our water treatment plant that uh, in today's design code weren't up to um, expectations and really what it was was strengthening the um, the wall and floor joints about three hundred and sixty thousand dollars worth 
that's substantially completed now. Excellent. Okay. There might have been one other, I think. I haven't got the... Uh, it, it was. It was just the uh, tree roots oh. on the drain. Okay. Item. That's it. Cool. Yep. Okay. Any further questions or comments about the activities report? We've, ah, yes, Miss Cook. Um, just to comment, it, going back to the um, the umbrella. Yes. It's in action in here. It's completed and it's been opened and it was wonderful. And so I just want to compliment the parks team for the work that was done to make that possible because I know that it had some challenges, um, but most successful and much appreciated by the Beck Fano in particular. So for all the effort that went into that, for whoever was involved, job well done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Ludlow. And just a quick comment on the same subject, an interesting challenge from Mrs Beck around uh, Matariki. Indeed. Which I'm sure the Parks Department picked up on because uh, I, I understand that the liaison between them and, and the Beck family has been outstanding and, and appreciated. There, there was also some mention of, of the, um, the success of the sculpture being there and, and a thought put into many heads that perhaps it's the site of a future sculpture park for Invercargill, just something to put into our future thinking. I think that's a, a great idea, Councillor Sava. You could almost fit a clock tower there. <laughs> and 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 many other interesting sculptures, Mr. Chair. Yeah, maybe some. It could almost pillars. be a public competition. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Obelisks. Okay, we've got four recommendations in front of us. It's actually five. We received the report. Um, I'll move those uh, all together. Do I have a seconder, please? Second, uh, Seconded, Councillor Skelt. I'm going to put those recommendations. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? They are carried. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Right, that brings us now to public excluded. Um, the reason for public excluded is for the receiving of the minutes of the 1st and 15th of March, and also to consider an application to extend water distribution network along Stead Street. Um, can I have someone move? Thank you, Councillor Amundsen. Seconded, Councillor Skelt, uh, including Mr. Lindsay McKenzie. Put that motion. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? We're now in public excluded. Thank you.